Last Saturday, I read an article in the Times by a man called Anthony Lloyd, who was reporting from a temporary orphanage in Sierra Leone that had been set up to take victims who'd lost their families to Ebola. The article included a picture of a little boy called Stevie, who was four years old. Lloyd recounted a conversation he'd had with the head social worker in the district, Mr Kamara. Stevie is very young and very traumatised, said Mr Kamara, so much so that he's only just beginning to speak. His documents are missing, so we aren't sure where he's from or what happened to his family. We're sure of just one thing. He's an Ebola survivor. Victoria, aged 16, watched eight of her nine siblings die of the deadly virus alongside her guardian aunt, one after another, in their home. Her entire family was wiped out over a period of only four weeks, yet she's been completely disowned by her extended family. My surviving aunts and one sister call me by phone, she told Lloyd, weeping in a sudden burst of uncontrollable anguish. But I can't go back to the village as the community won't accept me. So I'm completely alone. Mr Kamara explains to Lloyd that communities don't understand the science behind Ebola and why those who suffered it can in fact be an asset rather than a danger. Survivors have a strong resistance to the infection, probably immunity. They could serve their community in this crisis. Here ends my introductory story. Actually, story fragments, since the article went on for a couple more pages. And like many stories, the one I've just told is incomplete, ambiguous, multivocal, and, and pregnant with tropes that suggest but fall short of proving complex chains of causation. The story is both personal and political. It is Stevie's story, Victoria's story, Mr Kamara's story, Lloyd's story, Sierra Leone's story, Africa's story, the Ebola virus's story, and Rupert Murdoch's story. And it's my story, because I selected it to share with you today. I edited it, retold it, cast it as an exemplar of the story form. And it's your story, because it was chosen, edited, practised and read out with you in mind. And your moment-by-moment -moment reactions shaping the real-time telling. It is small wonder, then, that anecdotes, that perjurative word that epidemiologists use for stories that emphasises their subjective, idiosyncratic, unrepresentative and unreplicable nature, anecdotes are usually placed at the very bottom of the hierarchy of evidence. In his article, Anthony Lloyd juxtaposed individual, human, personal stories like those of Stevie and Victoria with other stories told by statistics. I quote again from his article, as more than 1,100 of Sierra Leone's 4,333 confirmed Ebola cases are believed by UNICEF to be children and with the rate of infection now doubling in the country every three weeks, as many as 28% of the final death toll are likely to be children under 16. Don't tell me numbers don't tell stories. And don't tell me these numbers are any more factual than the statement that Stevie is traumatised or that Victoria's extended family don't want her back. I suspect that if we tried hard enough, we would find people who would contest the number of children with Ebola in Sierra Leone just as we would be able to find people who would argue that Stevie is not as traumatised as Mr Kamara claims. Numbers are no more factual than so-called anecdotes. Quantitative data aren't true just because they're quantitative. Numbers, even statistically significant ones, mean very little indeed unless couched in a meaningful story. The really interesting thing about a series of numbers is why these numbers, rather than a different series of numbers, are being presented. Centuries ago, Aristotle characterised the art of rhetoric, that is, of persuasion. Rhetoric consists of three things. Logos, the facts or the message that you wish to convey. Ethos, the credibility of the speaker. And pathos, the appeal to emotions. The art of rhetoric, said Aristotle, and, and noted it is an art, not a science, is to achieve a judicious combination of logos, ethos and pathos. In his article in last week's Times, <clears throat> which was entitled 
orphaned, rejected and afraid, plight of the Ebola children, Anthony Lloyd was seeking to persuade the reader of two main arguments. First, that the epidemic is having a particularly bad effect on children, and second, that its social impact is made immeasurably worse by ignorance. If you look up Ebola in the medical literature, you'll get plenty of completely different stories. All of them seek to persuade their audience of a particular set of arguments about what is important, what is ethically justified, what is evidence-based, and so on. There are, for example, the personal accounts of doctors and nurses who've worked at the front line of this ghastly epidemic. They want to persuade us that it's tough at the coalface, that resources aren't getting through. There's the vaccine story, which depicts the cause of the Ebola epidemic as lack of effective vaccines. It predicts a cure just around the corner as big science rushes through the vaccine trials that will save a continent's children. This is a story to persuade us of the good side of the pharmaceutical industry and of the philanthropic generosity of the Wellcome Trust. All these stories use both words and numbers. They also use visual images, like photographs, maps and diagrams. Each story combines these different modalities rhetorically in an effort to persuade the intended audience of the importance and veracity of the account that the notion of stories or numbers is a false dichotomy. Stories use numbers, numbers tell stories, numbers can paint pictures, and so on. The skillful storyteller who understands his or her audience and crafts the narrative accordingly is more likely to persuade. In truth, as I suspect most of you know very well, there is no text, no set of figures, no picture, no experience that is self-interpreting. But I hope I've set you on the route to a stimulating discussion about both the philosophy and the practicalities of using stories, numbers, and indeed a host of other modalities in the effort to reduce suffering and improve patient outcomes. Thank you.